Welcome to the Support Automation Show, a podcast by Capacity. Join us for conversations with leaders in customer or employee support who are using technology to answer questions, automate processes, and build innovative solutions to any business challenge. I'm your host, Justin Schmidt. Justin Clegg, welcome to the Support Automation Show. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Where does this podcast find you? So uh, we are a Utah company, and I am currently uh, traveling to Chicago uh, for a trade show event uh, this week. Love Chicago as a St. Louis, and that's our weekend getaway big city. And I've spent okay. many, many a day in my life in, in Chicago, Illinois. Great place. First time in the city, so uh, excited to learn more and send some recommendations. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll do. So, Justin, you're the founder and CEO of Allset. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your journey to Allset, and what it is that Allset is out to do? Happy to. Um, so this is my fourth startup. Uh, I'm a repeat founder. I started my career in the Bay Area. I moved to Silicon Valley in 2013, uh, where I worked for large uh, tech companies leading in product and marketing capacities. Uh, from that point, I decided to make the jump into the wonderful world of startups and venture. Joined a couple of companies that were backed by uh you know, well-known accelerator programs like Y Combinator, uh, 500 Startups, uh, and a few other uh, programs uh, learned uh, by doing. And so I spent time, uh, I, I put in the, the grind and the hours uh, to understand, uh, you know, sort of the economics of startups and moved into a number of different roles and capacities uh, from head of growth to head of product uh, and really dug my heels into conversational AI, um, which uh, I think is what made it exciting for us to want to get together and chat today. Yeah, absolutely. And so we have been spending really the last decade um, researching and understanding, uh, you know, natural language processing, uh, machine learning, entity extraction, and understanding ways to make, uh, you know, conversational chatbot and commerce experiences feel more like a human in the room. Yeah, there is definitely not a lot of pushback I'm going to give you on the benefits of conversational AI, given given our um, shared interest in in the discipline and the and shared belief in the value that it drives for both the enterprise and you know you and I in our personal lives and just users in general, right? So all set itself is in this space. And what is it that you guys are trying to trying to do with all set? Yeah. So we built a conversational texting platform that's specifically focused on home service businesses. So when we talk about home services, we define that in a few different segments, uh, cleaning companies. So think window washers, pressure washing, uh, even auto detailing or carpets. And then we talk to contractors, so HVAC, plumbing, roofers, painters, uh, and then outdoor companies. So think uh, landscaping, lawn care, pest control, uh, and tree services. So uh, it's a really massive market. We have, there's about 5 million businesses in North America. And the opportunity for all set is that, you know, you have this industry that's completely overlooked and underserved from a, you know, Silicon Valley perspective, from a uh, perspective of, you know, emerging tech and conversational commerce. And so we're building tools to automate communications and payments uh, to make the overall customer experience stuck less, uh, both for homeowners who are in constant need of these services post pandemic uh, and for business owners uh, who are operating, running and trying to, to grow their business. Awesome. Yeah, there's one of the great things about the proliferation of conversational AI and chat and sort of support and service automation is that we have products available now across the industry spectrum, across the size of the business Um landscape, right? Everything from mom and pops all the way up to fortune 100 companies have tools at their disposal, have whether it's 
products they they buy on the open market or products they develop internally through available APIs and and a lot of the the DevOps tools available to to bring these products to the masses. And it's always a pleasure right. for me to to talk with somebody else who's who's has a shared vision on this. My first question for you, Justin, is the same one I ask everybody at the start of this show. When I say the word support automation, what does that mean to you? Yeah, it, it's a good question. Um, we think about support uh, automation in a few different capacities and contexts. Um, uh, they're situational, and you know, it really comes down to uh, how you handle things like customer service, um, how you handle a contact center, uh, how you know, even from a sales perspective, how we think about qualifying and handing over uh, a live agent. Uh, you know, once it's been identified as a lead. Um, and then we also think a lot about content, right? So content distribution. Um, and I think support automation should be able to address all of those capacities um, to an extent. Um, and, you know, making it in our earlier conversation, uh, making it feel like there's a human in the room um, without, you know, sort of breaking down the experience. And so, uh, that's probably how we would structure um, and how I would think about the the world of support automation today. Yeah, I, I share a lot of that sentiment. And one of the areas where you guys have spent a lot of investment in the product, at least from my outsider looking in perspective, is, it's correct to assume all sets the primary modality of the engagement that your customers have with their customers is through SMS, correct? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So SMS is so ubiquitous and you know, whether you're 16 and you're getting your first phone or you're 60, it's uh, really in the U S at least it's this application that everybody is familiar with. Um, immediately it's UI lists, uh, you know, to, to an extent, uh, and you know, the biggest question we've always been asking over the last decade is, you know, why is it so ubiquitous, you know, compared to, some of these other ecosystems and platforms that are, you know, growing uh, exponentially outside of the United States, i.e., you know, WhatsApp um, or WeChat or you know some of these other platforms. So, uh, yeah, are primarily SMS based, um, and that's mostly because of the high open rates um, and you know high read rates. Yeah, there's no user training that you need to do to teach somebody how to text on their phone, right? Like there's no new app to install. There's no new UX paradigm to use. So you really do have this, uh, to use a computer science term, you're writing to the metal, so to speak, of yeah. the way people interact with each other, which is, which is extremely cool. In your customers, and this is something we deal with too, and I'm just a little inside baseball, a couple a couple conversational AI nerds chatting here. <laughs> the NLP, entity matching, when to pull a human in the loop, all, all that stuff aside, one of the really interesting things to look at when you're onboarding users into a conversational AI-driven environment in support automation is just some principles of conversational design, right? Like I look at some of the larger chat players in the space, intercom, drift, you know, then we talk desk, for example, all, all these things, live person. One of the really interesting things that I see a lot is where and when customers want to infuse their own brand and personality into the conversational design of, of, of the chat they use and where they sort of seem to lean most into out of the box formatting and templates or um, even maybe biasing less towards brand and personality and more towards like, what can I do to maximize the conversion whatever the conversion goal of the particular chat that we've deployed is, right? How does Allset work with the service businesses that you guys use on this question of conversational design? Do you mostly out of the box or do you kind of guide through semi-personalization based on the business and the industry that they're in? Yeah, it's a great question. So the experience today 
um, is relatively simple. Um, when a service appointment is completed in someone's home, uh, the business is going to mark that as completed in their field service CRM. When that moment takes place, that's when all set takes over from a conversational AI perspective. So uh, a, an event is triggered. Um, we're going to post uh, and essentially um, you know, send a text to the homeowner, letting them know uh, that you know the service was completed. And we're going to prompt them to do a number of different interactions uh, post-service. So those interactions can range from leaving a tip uh, to leaving a review uh, to creating a referral uh, and referring a family or friend, um, even to completing a payment. And so you have uh, all of these you know, different contexts. And what we found, I think the biggest discovery was that uh, we are very much uh, a guided experience where we prompt and, and we're big folk, you know, believers in focus on a very specific intent. If the context and the intent is too broad, uh, end users will get lost and then they end up just kind of ignoring it or moving on to the next experience. And so in all sets case, uh, you know, it's very much a user flow that starts from, you know, capturing a payment to then leaving a tip. Uh, to then leaving a positive review because you've already opened up the customer's wallet. And from there, then prompting referrals and going from there. So we've, you know, we think about conversational design a lot. And to your question and point on branding, we have to be very intentional about things like the length, the time of day, the cadence of each message, uh, the personality, uh, the um, you know, branding. So do these messages say powered by all set? At what point does the consumer feel safe to leave a payment through a random text? Um, and, you know, those are things that we have to think about when we do get or move the user to a UI from the initial SMS experience. Your point about intent is something that I think all support leaders that listen to this show or if this part of the conversation gets clipped for sharing on social, this is this is something that I think is really important is that focusing on the intent of what you're trying to do. Because a lot of the times when there is frustration from the customer with automation, it is the classic, the, the paradigmatic example of this is sitting on the phone and saying, speak to an agent, speak to an agent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want the, to the talk I, to the and, yeah, yeah the, the, the IVR like recursive loop of death when you just want to talk to somebody. <laughs> and a lot of times like that can be mitigated by giving very clear instruction in the sort of voice menu or in our case, in our being it's in chat provide, you know, a conversational AI understanding kind of from if you're going to guide to make sure that you you build that conversation with a very specific intent to avoid the frustration, gain trust, do all these other things. Because one of the things that comes up on this show, and this is, I'm going to see if I can land the plane gracefully into my next question sure. to you, <laughs> is there is sometimes pushback inside businesses to bring automation into the business, right? Whether it's, I don't want to inspire at a large call center, I don't want to install some tool that's going to make all my agents think I'm trying to replace them, right? Or I don't want to create cus uh, customer confusion and frustration with the recursive loop of IVR hell or whatever it is. I'm curious to hear your take on this because you deal a lot with service-oriented businesses. I would assume a lot of small businesses too, just given the nature of that, of that space. So where the customer relationship in a service business is like literally everything, right? The, and all businesses say their customers are most important thing. And that's, that's true, but it's, it's really true in a service business where if the relationship doesn't go well, the customer can go to Google reviews or Facebook or whatever it is. And you can kind of create a death spiral for yourself like, from, from bad, inter <laughs> from bad interactions. I'm curious to hear from your point of view, what some of the challenges that you, or maybe not 
you specifically, but just some of the trepidation of bringing automation into the service space and what leaders and business owners there can do to mitigate some of those challenges? I love the question. So number one, we have to talk about, um, you know, engendering trust into the conversation and how quickly can you build trust with a phone number? And uh, another way to think about this is what is the relationship that the retail customer, in this case, a homeowner, should have uh, with a phone number, right? And so who is the phone number from? What is the associated area code? Uh, is it a long code, you know, with your standard 10 digits? Is it a short code? Um, and we've looked at, found a lot of research, you know, short code phone numbers are actually perceived to be spammy, right? And so you get a uh, higher uh, risk or higher concern that, that there is sort of that spam. So number one is, is how do you build trust between the phone number that's being powered by all set, owned by the business, and then viewed by the consumer? And so we have to be very upfront and intentional about uh, setting expectations in that context. Hey, you're going to be receiving a phone number um, or a text message from this phone number. Uh, this is not a you know spam. You can opt out anytime. Uh, you know this is something that we endorse as a business. And so it's helping professionalize the business's um, representation of themselves through this number. And you know a challenge that we run into quite a bit is that. You know, there's a lot of software that can provision, you know, a phone number from a Twilio, Clevo, Nexmo. And so how do you think about handling um, and routing a variety of phone numbers uh, and even things like taking an existing phone number that a business owns and making it textable, right? Which are things that, that we think about quite a bit. And so that's kind of the first step is how do you establish trust with a phone number and get the consumer, you know, feeling comfortable. The second is then how do you think about, uh, you know, the conversation derailing? So we talk a lot about user stories uh, in development and product. We have to create almost conversation stories where you have scenario mapping uh, that's beyond just a traditional decision tree. The decision tree is the reason why most people hate chatbots and why they became this like shiny toy in 2016. And then crashed and burned because people realized, oh, it's a feature, not a business. <laughs> and, you know, decision trees uh, are pretty simple. And so we ingest a lot of data. We take um, a lot of unstructured data. Our biggest surprise is that people have thoughts and they want to share them. And they text those phone numbers back like they're a friend or a family member. And what that means for us is we have a lot of um, unstructured data, a lot of feedback, um, and that could be derailed in a number of use cases. Hey, Justin, I want to reschedule. Hey, uh, your team did an amazing job. I want to compliment you guys. Hey, I have a complaint. You missed the spot. You know, come back. I hate you guys. <laughs> or it's, uh, you know, things like, um, you know, random questions or random thoughts. And now you've got, you know, it doesn't fall into the complaint or, uh, you know, compliment category. So as, as we think about those different contexts, um, the number one goal for us is to prevent conversations from being derailed and providing useful and insightful uh, responses uh, so that uh, you know, we can add value to both the end user without upsetting them and also let the business know that these insights are coming into the, into the conversation. The ability to own as many communication channels with your customer as possible is universally a good thing, right? It's, it's good to be able to reach your customer on their terms and be able to parse their language to give them what they're looking for in the easiest and simplest way possible and to avoid the the sort of multi-channel handoff hell that could happen if 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 this isn't all well done and i like the theme that you've brought up 
several times in this conversation already of intention and how leaders need to really build their support automation initiatives in whatever form that takes with intention, whether that's conversational design or the workflow automation that may go on in your ticketing system on how to resolve tickets or whatever it is, right? Um, one thing that I'm curious on your take on, given the limitations of SMS and the potential future of something like RCS being widely adopted, do you see in a world where, let's say, RCS is the new SMS is gone, RCS Apple acquiesces and everyone gets along and RCS at least becomes an option on every single phone. Do you still see most conversational design being sort of text-based and trying to keep it in the in as much of a box as possible? Or do you see more vendors and technology providers branch out and start using a, the more... I don't want to say infinite canvas, but a much wider canvas of the types of formatting and buttons and, and replies and all the other stuff that you can do with something like iMessage or RCS. Yeah. So there's no doubt that, you know, RCS, um, you know, having access to rich media within an interface um, is going to provide more value in terms of selection, carouseling, uh, imagery, photography. Um, we do a lot with MMS today. Uh, and MMS, you know, we can build Netflix-like experiences within our product where we have thumbnails or faces of, you know, the contractors or the technician. You've got logos. And people are drawn to people, right? So when you can display those things, there's always a, an advantage in terms of building that trust and that experience. So um, I think... Uh, you know, one, having an omni-channel strategy, I completely agree with your approach that uh, consumers want to be able to communicate with a business in a variety of channels. And it really just becomes a case-by-case -case, uh, personal preference. Um, we have customers who, you know, are in, uh, you know, between kind of that 35 to 55 demographic. They just need to get on the phone and know that everything's working okay. They don't need access to a chatbot. They don't need some ticketing support system. And we have folks on the other end who are, you know, very self-service, right? They don't want to make a phone call. They don't want to chat with anybody. So obviously our number is, our support line is textable. And so they'll send a text in. Uh, they'll ask a few questions. Um, and, you know, we rely heavily on MMS, on screenshots and, you know, custom link sharing and building so that we can get them to the support tools and experience that they need uh, on the spot. And then they can continue on with their day. So uh, it, it's really people have different jobs that they want to, you know, to get done when reaching out to a business. Um, and the goal is to be proactive and to, you know, number one, deflect, um, you know, as many sort of easy questions or softballs as we might call them. Uh, and then the other aspect is the containment, right? And just making sure that we can give them um, access to information uh, in a seamless way. Yes, the impetus to deflect and the desire to contain is absolutely a North Star for automated support using you know, conversational AI or, or even if it's not... Um, conversational driven contextual menus and buttons to click and actions to take to resolve the issue as, as fast as the laws of physics allow. This has been a great conversation, Justin. I could talk to you all day about this. I want to end with the same question I ask everyone at the end of, of the episode. And that is when you look at the future, say the next 10 years of automation in the support world and the conversation we've had today, what is it that excites you the most? Ooh. Um, so I, I would say, I mean, it, it, a few thoughts. One, support becomes anticipatory. Uh, you can start to build out predictive modeling to answer support questions before uh, even the end user, the consumer of the product knows that they need support. 
So I think that's, that's interesting. Um, you know, we see, I mean, powerful tools like capacity and others that are out there, um, can present, um, intelligent knowledge bases that, you know, again, they know exactly what the customer is going to need based on where they are at in that customer journey. And then the second thing that personally I get excited about is just seeing more ecosystems that are built around, um, you know, support. And so, for example, when we look at WeChat in China, uh, a consumer uh, can go into WeChat and they can do a variety of experiences. They can order a cab, they can order a meal, send money, pay friends, um, do social media, right, and communicate in chat, which are kind of like those core values of human connection. And so when I think about the world of support, um, you know, you've got kind of this uh, merge between virtual assistants and just overall efficiency. And is there, you know, kind of a, a, a one off, you know, catch all platform that handles all support needs across all platforms. Uh, and that obviously I think becomes the Holy grail. So it's not just specific to uh, our particular companies or products, uh, but instead uh, it's a one-stop shop to be able to, to get support um, across billing, across you know, technology um, at scale. And I think if you can, there's a world where uh, that ecosystem it becomes available and true and consolidates all of my support needs across all of my tools uh, and things that I'm invested in. Uh, I'm interested in that world that, you know, sign me up. Yeah. The, the concept of the super app. And it's interesting that we don't have one of those necessarily in the United States, but like WeChat's the ultimate example of it. Justin, to end our show and then do our world famous quick fire round, much like the roadside diner has world famous fried chicken or whatever. But <laughs> one of these days, I'm going to come up with a brand for this. And I joke sometimes that the brand for the quick fire round is me telling the guests that one of these days I'm going to come up for a brand. So maybe I'm just going to call it like the unbranded quick fire round. What's the book you most often recommend to people? Professionally, Atomic Habits. Uh, personally, The Alchemist. Um, both, both great, great books to, uh, uh, really focus on, uh, you know, aligning yourself, um, uh, and, you know, building, uh, intentional, um, focused habits, uh, and finding, uh, you know, your personal treasure. Uh, th those are, I, I think, important things, uh, you know, in, uh, in doing business and in living your life. Couldn't agree more in terms of the various hacks, automations, workflows, et cetera, that you've set up for yourself to be as productive as possible and to um, be able to manage a startup and keep your sanity. What's the productivity practice that you've brought into your life that has stuck with you and is the one you recommend the most to people? Uh, be consistent. So, hmm. and, you know, be the hardest, per hardest working person in the room. And I think if you can combine those two uh, you can become dangerous. Love it. Is there a website, blog, Slack community, LinkedIn group, et cetera, for support leaders or business owners looking to increase their ability to deliver world-class support in a semi-automated or scalable way? What, what would you recommend? I'm not a part of a ton and I'd love to be a part of more. So um, we're constantly on the lookout. Um, but the first place I would go is uh, likely a Facebook community or a LinkedIn group uh, to, to meet with some of those like-minded professionals. Yeah, there's there's some good ones out there. And I'll shoot you a note when we get done recording here of, Please of, do. Thank you. Yeah, of all the ones that, that guests have recommended. There's, there's definitely a lot. If there is one person in the business world that you could take out for, for lunch or coffee or a cocktail just to pick their brain, who would it be? Um, I wouldn't be able to because uh, he recently passed, uh, but Clayton Christensen has been, uh, I think, a really powerful um, example uh, in terms of somebody who uh, understands, uh, you know, strong business theory and principles, uh, articulates it in a way that is easy to understand, uh, but also lives his life and conducts his life in a way that um, is something that I, I'd like to aspire to be uh, more like, so... Uh, definitely. He's the one that wrote The Innovator's Dilemma, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So Disruptive Innovation, um, Innovator's Dilemma, 
and uh, yeah, very underrated uh, business leader uh, in the community over the last, you know, 10, 20 years. Excellent. Justin, if people wanted to find out more information about yourself or Allset, where could they go to find you? Yeah, start with tryallset.com. And that's uh, our website. Allset is a Utah-based company. Uh, We're growing very quickly. So uh, that's where I would point people to learn more about our company. Awesome. Justin, thank you so much for joining me on the Support Automation Show, and you have a wonderful day. Thanks, Justin. Bye-bye. The Support Automation Show is brought to you by Capacity. Visit capacity.com to find everything you need for automating support and business processes in one powerful platform. You can find the show by searching for Support Automation in your favorite podcast app. Please subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Capacity, thanks for listening.